Welcome to the One Record Insight. So this is episode two this week, and this is going to be uh, focused on the data model. So today uh, I'm uh, David Sov, uh, manager of Digital Cargo, and I'm with uh, Christophe Lambert, who is uh, our data expert uh, within the within the team. So the second episode, uh, it's about the data model, uh, about the digital twin for the air cargo industry. And this is the second episode of a series of uh, six webinars uh, that we scheduled um, throughout the month of July. So the episode three will be focused on the ontology, the episode four on the API, the episode five on the security, and finally the last one will be focused on the pilot testing. So today uh, we're going to um, explain a bit of uh, what we do uh, with regards to the data model. Uh, with the first part on why we need a data model. Then we are going to look at the scope of it and uh, have a look at what's behind uh, the data model in terms of uh, standard. Then Christophe will explain to you uh, how it has been designed, uh, how can we uh, use it uh, in the context of Air Cargo uh, with uh, use case. And finally, uh, we will have a bit of time for your questions and answers. So this is a webinar, so you can only hear the presenters and uh, your microphones are disabled, so you cannot speak. However, uh, you can use the questions box to raise any questions um, and you just need to type in and we'll see the questions. This uh, meeting is recorded uh, so that you can have access to it afterwards. Uh, you just need to click on the same link and you should be able to have the replay. Um, and then afterwards, we'll be uh, able as well to post uh, the presentation and the video recording on our website. So today we're going to use uh, Slido as well in order to keep you awake. Um, you can uh, already join uh, Slido now uh, using your uh, mobile phone or your tablets or uh, computer. Slido.com and the uh, event code is 1RDM in capitals. So in order to test uh, if everything is working well, I suggest that we can go through our first questions and I would like to hear from you. Uh, where are you working from? So you can type in and answer the question. We have only one respondent. Oh. Sure. Seems like uh, most of you are working from home still. More than 80% of the people are working from home. We have 3% of, oh no, we had 3% of lucky guys on the beach. But. Okay, so. <clears throat> So now we're going to start with the first part, which is uh, why we need a data model. And uh, last week, during the first episode, um, we introduced uh, the context of Air Cargo. Uh, we mentioned about the need to have uh, more, info, more and more information sharing. And uh, we uh, explained as well the vision of uh, one record, which is to have a end-to-end -end digital logistic and transport supply chain, where the data is easily accessible by all the different parties that uh, would need are required to have access to this data. 
So when we talk about end-to-end digital logistics and transport supply chain, it means that we need to have all the different parties uh, involved from the shipper to the consignee, including the freight forwarder, the ground handling agent, the customs authorities, of course the airline, but also any other parties who wants to have uh, access to the data. And for that, in order that in order to make sure that all these parties they can work uh, together uh, smoothly, we need to define a common language so that everyone has the same understanding of uh, the, the meaning of the data. And also, uh, what we want to uh, achieve is to ease access to the data. And a data model is essential to uh, have an ontology where the, the new players, they will be able to have access to this information. So when we look at the one record concept, uh, we um, introduced the three pillars, which are around the data, APIs, and security. And today, our focus will be on the data, uh, which is uh, going to um, be the, the central pillar to make sure that we can have this common language. So now we just uh, go through uh, the first questions. And uh, I would like to know uh, what is your most painful challenge uh, when it comes to um, data sharing. So it seems like um, the, one of the biggest challenges is the lack of interoperability between the different systems. Then we have the lack of data sharing, second position. And in the third position, a lack of common cargo glossary. Yeah, definitely the lack of interoperability is your biggest challenge. Okay. So now we're going to look at the scope of our data model. So the scope of our data model is focused around the um, airline core ontology. Uh, what we call airline core ontology is actually all the different data elements uh, that enable to have the requirement to, um, to manage the transport of the general cargo. So the way it has been designed is that it is detailed and expensive enough to be able to um, manage uh, all the different um, shipments at piece uh, level. And uh, so we, do, we can do with that the piece level management and the piece level tracking as well. And then on top of this airline core ontology, uh, which is basically uh, the, um, the, the coverage of today the master web bill and the house web bill, we define additional um, add-ons, which are, which are the sets of data elements that would be required to handle specific uh, shipments, such as the dangerous goods, uh, pharmaceutical products, but also to take into account um, different operations, such as uh, cargo dif distributions, interactive cargo, usually tracking, uh, cargo ops, uh, and uh, so on. So as you can see, what we did is that we look at the core and we add up uh, additional elements uh, whenever required uh, or when we have um, requirements from the industry. So for that, what we did is that we went through a, a ideation process uh, where we identify all the different uh, elements that could be uh, considered into the data model. Then we went through an assessment session uh, to prioritize the different topics. And finally, we identified uh, these add-ons and we assigned them to dedicated uh, focus group, which are a subset of the one record task force. And uh, to be able to develop the data model, uh, the different activities are uh, articulated around four activities. So we have first uh, the business needs, 
uh, where we need to understand uh, what we need uh, in type of information, who are going to be the different parties involved, and uh, once we have identified these business needs, we will be able to deep uh, into more detail to identify the data elements themselves. These data elements uh, will need to discuss about uh, the type, uh, the granularity, uh, and then we will be able to integrate these data elements into the data model and define business rules associated to them if necessary. Finally, once we have all the data model with the business rules, uh, we will uh, generate the JSON schema, uh, which are going to be integrated in the ontology tool. So now that we've seen the scope of the data model, um, I have an open question for you. I would like to know whether uh, we miss something in the data model or if everything has been covered. So for that, uh, I would like to know um, if um, there are uh, some elements that you see that should be part of this data model. So normally you should be able to type in. Uh, and if there is nothing, it's a good news for me because it means that we covered everything. Okay, that's a good one. Yes, the connection to the MCD, uh, this is something that Christophe will uh, explain to you later. Uh, we have integrated, so we organized um, working groups uh, with, uh, with a uh, modern cancer distribution um, expert group uh, that uh, identified uh, the business requirement for cargo distribution. And uh, we have uh, identified uh, elements that could uh, be integrated to the model. I see here as well integration with other models of transport, multimodal. See lots of IOD, and this is something actually that will come uh, very shortly. Uh, we e just uh, launched the Interactive Cargo Task Force. Um, last month, with one of the one of the objective of this task force will be to look at uh, the data elements uh, that would be required to enable um, the data sharing of uh, connected devices such as uh, temperature, geolocations, uh, but also um, shocks, uh, pressure, or whatever you would imagine that the sensor can capture. Here we have a pretty good uh, feedback. Uh, this is typically the, 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 the thing that we will uh, be able to uh, analyze and uh, to uh, look at uh, into um, the details. Okay. So now we're going to look at uh, what's behind the data model standards in terms of uh, components. So uh, just to share with you, we have uh, set a, uh, under the One Record Task Force a subgroup of experts. And with this uh, subgroup of experts, we do a regular uh, bootcamp in order to look at uh, the specificities of the data model. We had one last year in Geneva. Another one uh, earlier this year in Madrid and uh, had uh, two additional ones uh, virtually uh, on uh, conference calls. And with uh, this uh, group of people, we delivered uh, five main uh, components, uh, which is uh, the main uh, component for the data model standard. 
So the first one is a design uh, principle document which explains uh, how the data model has been designed. Uh, then we have a, a conceptual data model that gives uh, the interaction between the different uh, objects. Um, and then um, we have a logical data model which gives uh, the details of this uh, object with all the attributes and uh, uh, the definition on all the attributes uh, with the descriptions and the cardinality, uh, whether these are optional or monetary. And uh, also for the, we identified uh, some use cases that are linked with the IATA uh, master operating plan. And for each of these activities, we identified the object and um, attributes that need to be taken into account, uh, where the different stakeholders need to create or update uh, objects. And finally, uh, we have uh, developed an ontology, and for that we use uh, the tool uh, called Protege, which has been developed by the, standard, uh, the Stanford University. And uh, this tool will uh, enable us to have a clear view on the different objects, the link between them, and uh, the different contexts. So all these uh, components, they, are, they have been published on GitHub, uh, they are um, available for free, and uh, you can have access. Um, it's an open, it's an open, uh, open uh, access, uh, publicly available. So, as we see the different uh, components, uh, the question is uh, to, for you: uh, what is um, what would be the component that would be the most helpful for you to implement on ICA? So in terms of use cases, uh, what we did is that uh, we look at uh, the different uh, steps from the MOP. We look at the details of the different uh, activities and we try to match uh, the logical object, the common object and the attributes with this, with this MOP. So basically what we, uh, what we um, provided in the tool is an explanation of what uh, the different stakeholders need to, to do uh, in a specific context of the process. And the logical data model will give you all the details of uh, the object and the attributes. Okay, so it seems like uh, the main uh, component uh, would be the use cases. So this is something that we'll uh, give a great focus on. Uh, and then the second uh, one uh, that is important to you is the logical data model, which contains actually all the details of the standard. So now we'll hand over to Christoph, uh, who is going to explain uh, how the data model has been designed. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so now we will enter into the, the details of um, what is the data model today. Um, first of all, what are the requirements for this data model? Um, basically, we have four main high-level requirements. Um, they were mostly explained and uh, discussed before, so I will go through them quickly. The first one is to actually cover the end-to-end -end supply chain. So the idea is for the data model to really ca capture and record everything that, that happens uh, in the, between the, um, all the stakeholders in the transportation of goods. 
Um, then we need to find the optimal balance in terms of simplicity, flexibility, and robustness of the data model. Um, then the, the, the main, one of the main objectives also of one record uh, as a whole is to optimize the usage of modern technologies to facilitate data exchange. So as, we've, as we've seen in the, in the previous questions, uh, the interoperability between uh, stakeholders seems very important to you, and this is really one of the focus uh, that is made in, uh, on one record. And the last one is that we want to minimize the redundancy of data in the model, um, basically having data only at a single place uh, without duplication in, uh, in any, uh, every system. So to answer these requirements, um, we have built the data model based on four main design principles. Um, the first one is that the data model is P-centric. Um, then it is physics-oriented, meaning that we apply what we call the digital twin concept. Um, then there is only one single source of truth uh, in terms of data, and of course, uh, the data model is data-driven uh, as opposed to the document-driven um, world that is today. So to speak a little bit more on, the, on each of these pillars, um, the first one being P-centric. Basically, the industry today is trying to shift from a shipment level management to a piece level management. And this starts with what we call the piece level tracking. Um, that means that the piece should be and is at the center of the model and is deeply linked to other elements, the other elements of the cargo supply chain. Um, just a quick um, overview of what is a piece. Um, the, de the definition we, we took uh, in the data model is that the piece is a uniquely identified physical single unit which may form all or part of a shipment. Um, so it's really the, the centric uh, element of the, um, of the data model today. Then the second pillar that we have is that the data model is physics oriented. That means basically that physical entities in the real world have digital twins in the data model. For example, an airplane, a ULD, uh, and a package, um, they have digital twins that are easily uh, understandable in the data model as they are identified as such. Uh, and it really eases the interaction with actual operations as the elements that are existing in the, in the physical world are exactly replicated in the uh, data model. And this brings also an easy, uh, an easy sharing and transparency of the data throughout the supply chain, as any stakeholder should be able to easily understand what is the concept behind uh, a specific object. Um, just as a, as a quick uh, quote here, uh, we have the, the, the notion of a digital twin. Um, what we call digital twin is the digital replica of a physical entity. Um, then the, the third uh, pillar that we have is that we have designed the data model uh, in order to have only one single source of truth. Um, that means that any data that is uh, used, uh, that exists in the one recall world should have a clear ownership. Um, that means also that uh, the integrity and accuracy of the data is ensured as the data owner is the only one responsible and uh, only one maintaining his, uh, his own data. And there is, in the end, a very strong trust uh, that is implied um, and that is really important um, if we want to replace the paper-based documents uh, that are today uh, the legal sources and the legal, um, I would say, basis uh, for the, all the information that are shared um, in the transport supply chain. The, the last one that we have is that, the, of course, the, the model is data-driven. Um, this means that we want to move from a document-based world to a database world. Uh, that means that data is at the core of one record and that is designed around data and not around documents. Um, the documents that they exist today, for example, the waybills, um, they will be the results basically of data aggregation from different objects. Um, and that is really important in the way we, we have designed data model. And to cover, I would say, the legal aspects um, of that, um, that is, there is one topic that will be addressed in the further uh, webinars which are the APIs and security mechanisms that have been thought and designed uh, and specified to, to help uh, achieve these, uh, these legal requirements regarding the, the, the documents that do not exist in the one recall world. 
Um, and to, to, to complement that, um, all the semantic web and link data principles uh, are applied to, the, to this data model. This means that all, all, all objects are linked directly or indirectly. Uh, this is called the link data. This is the principle of link data. Um, that means also that we, there is no redundancy of data required as from one side of the data model, you, can, you should be able to access the other side of the data model, basically. Um, and the, the consequence of that is that the, the semantic uh, relations that exist in the data model, um, they are easily described uh, in ontology that are match and readable. Uh, so they, that, that are really um, easily um, implementable uh, in any system. So we have a, then a new question for you uh, on, our, on the Slido. Uh, the question is, are you ready to shift your mindset from shipment level management to piece level management? So this is a really important question for us as in parallel with the industry that is really aiming to, to go to a piece level management, the data model and one record as a, as a whole um, has been thought uh, with the piece at the center. Um, so your, your, your feedbacks on, on these are really important for us to, to know um, what, what, what may be the constraints today uh, or the thoughts of uh, industry stakeholders to move forward to, uh, to a piece level management. So, so far with the answers we have, the, I would say the good thing is that we have no one that answered no, uh, which is a very good thing for what we're trying to do here. And it seems that there are basically a mixed feeling between the three yeses. So a plain yes, um, yes, but we face organization and process constraints, and yes, but we face technical constraints. So it seems that there is, uh, I would say in two thirds of the cases, a but. Uh, which is technical constraints or organization slash process constraints, and they are almost at the same level. So what we take from that is that uh, we seem to be in a good situation to, to move forward to piece level management, um, but it seems that there are still some, uh, some things to figure out in order to be able to, to embrace the piece level management movement. Okay. Thank you for your offer inputs on that. Um, so this is a transition for us to go to the, five, the fifth part, um, to go a bit further into the data model and see how this model can be applied to the air cargo. So I will not go into too much details uh, in this part because the idea is not to I would say to overflow you with uh, many, many information and many detailed information. Uh, we'll focus now on the, uh, I would say, the high-level model. Um, so basically, at first, the model focuses on the goods that are being transported, meaning that we have the product, uh, being the shipper product, items, PCs, and shipment. So you can see here that we have the piece that is uh, at the center here, and that is basically linked to, to any other objects at this stage. Um, we then have what we called um, before digital twins. So here we have digital twins of physical assets. Um, so as you can see, we have the transport means. Uh, the transport means are basically the, the airplanes here. They can be trucks or in a multimodal environment. They can be also vessels from for the sea. Um, we have the transport segments uh, that should that cover the transport movements. Uh, we have also the ULDs, uh, which are the containers, and as you can see, the, the PCs. So the, the different relationship um, between the, the items are explained here in a semantic way. And to, to answer also one of the questions that, were, uh, that was uh, given before, um, the data model today um, aims to cover, to, co to cover the booking process. Um, meaning that we have taken input from uh, the cargo distribution um, work group that, um, that has uh, been, um, been working in a workshop at the, in the, at the beginning of uh, 2020. 
Um, and what came from that is that we have what we call the quote request, the offers and the bookings that are elements that directly come from the, the distribution process. Uh, and this is uh, captured through the, the way bill um, that really is the, the contractual um, aspect between, uh, between these elements. Um, then to go a little bit deeper into uh, the data model, um, we will try to, I will try to, to explain you uh, how the data model has, uh, has been thought to be used through a simplified use case. Uh, when I say simplified, it means that we can have thousands and thousands of different use cases um, in, the, in the transportation of cargo. Uh, what we have imagined here to briefly uh, show you how the data model has been designed and should be used is really a simple, uh, simple use case in five steps. Um, so it covers basically a door-to-door -door shipment. Um, the first step is that the shipper prepares the cargo for delivery to a customer. So this is quite straightforward. Then the second step is that a forwarder um, arranged basically for the, for the shipment. So he receives the shipment from the shipper arrange the booking with the airline and hands over the shipment to the airlines or the, the ground handling agent. Um, then we have the airline or GHA that come into, uh, into action. Um, so at export, um, they accept the shipment into the warehouses and load basically the shipments onto a, onto a flight or different flights, but in this case, it's, it's a single flight and at import, the, um, there is, of, of course, the unloading from the flight and the handover of the shipment to the full water. Then um, this goes to the fourth step, uh, which is when the full water uh, comes into, into action again. Um, what the full water does at the destination airport is to easily collect the shipment and it basically delivers to the consignee, or it can be a hand, cust an, a hand customer, for example. And the last step that we that was thought for this simplified use case is that the consignee just received the shipment. So as you can see, this simplified use case in, the, in five steps represents basically a door-to-door -door, uh, door -door delivery. And also to, to make things easier in this case, uh, we have taken the assumption that it's general cargo, so there's no dangerous goods involved and stuff like that. So to go uh, into this, uh, this use case. Um, so the first step, uh, as the shipper prepares the cargo for delivery to a customer, um, we have highlighted the, the elements in the data model um, that should be either created or updated uh, at this stage. Um, meaning that for this first step, the shipper should be responsible for initi initiating the piece, item, and product objects if they do not exist already. The product in most cases should be, uh, should be already existing. Um, and also the shipment that uh, represents um, all, the, all the pieces that are supposed to be shipped. Um, in specific cases when you have a, a, a ULD uh, that exists from the starting point, for example, a pharmaceutical ULD, um, the ULD element, of course, uh, can be used, will be linked to the pieces, and uh, will be updated throughout the, the whole um, the whole uh, the whole use case. Um, then the second step, so the shipper has prepared uh, its cargo and hands over to the to the forwarder. So the forwarder receives the shipment, arranges the booking with the airline, and hands over the shipment. So as a first step, um, so we have the transport segment and transport means representing the, the movement from the shipper to the, to the forwarder. Um, then the booking is made between the forwarder uh, and the airline. Um, and this is where the, um, the cargo distribution process comes into, uh, into place. So we have the whole quote request, offer, booking, and waybill objects uh, that should be created at this stage. So to have a quick overview of the process, so the, at this stage, the forwarder issues a quote request to the airline. Uh, if we don't have an existing one, for example. Um, then the airline uh, responds to this quote request with um, one or um, multiple offers. Um, and from these offers, usually one is selected by the, 
by the by the forwarder, and there is also um, a capacity check uh, between the forwarder and the, the airline to conclude into a booking and create a waybill object uh, that represents a contract um, between the forwarder and the, and the airline. Uh, during the, the whole phase, um, basically any movement of the pieces um, can be represented with um, associated transport segments and transport means, uh, meaning that every, for example, truck movement uh, should be represented by a transport segment and associated with a transport means that is a truck. But in this model, we, we try to be as exhaustive and as extensive as possible. So, for example, any movement between in, in the, the warehouse could be um, could be modeled, modeled here. Uh, so, for example, any forklift movement within the warehouse could be uh, could be uh, recorded uh, as movement with a transport segment and a transport means. Um, so we have all the possibilities here to define um, basically on to which level of details we want to go in terms of movement of the pieces. Um, and during the whole this whole process, um, pieces can uh, the, the statuses of the pieces can be updated with different events. Events can be uh, loading on the truck, unloading from the truck, uh, and any kind of mechanism can be can be defined um, on on the on the back end uh, to automatically or not uh, create these kind of events. Uh, so you can imagine, for example, that um, as soon as a, as a truck departs, uh, any piece that has been loaded on this truck uh, as as the event that is at, that it has been loaded. Uh, so we have many many ways to to use the data model here, uh, and this is what is uh, what is really interesting in here. So we have a basis, and anyone can basically go into more details. Uh, it really depends on the on the possibility to do so, and the, also the um, I would say the the need to do so because some events may, might not be uh, relevant to to track. Um, then um, when the when the pieces when the shipping uh, is transferred from the formwater hub to the to the carrier domain. Uh, we arrive at the stage three. Um, so as I said at the beginning, at export, the the carrier or the GHA um, accepts the shipment into the warehouse, uh, and it is then loaded onto a flight. Um, of course, in between the flight uh, departs and arrives at destination airport. And at import, uh, the shipment is basically end, ended over to the to the forwarder. Um, so here, any movement of the PCs or UAD into the warehouse can be recorded uh, as transport segment and associated to transport means. So this is something I said I, I presented just on the on the stage before. Um, when the pieces are loaded um, onto the flight, um, basically the the transport segment can be um, can be can be updated with um, an associated event um, or the pieces, depending on how you want to implement that. Um, the departure and ar arrival of the flight are captured with events on the transport segment. Um, I might not have to go into much details in, uh, in the events, um, but basically any any object that we have seen in the in the data uh, so far uh, can have different events. Uh, today, the approach is very generous to, to allow for great flexibility and great, I would say, many ways of, of using uh, these events. But such, uh, such events as uh, departure and arrival can be easily captured uh, on the transport segment here. Um, and then the loading on the, of the pieces from the flight uh, and loading on a specific trunk uh, to go to the forwarder can be... Um, can be recorded through a transport segment and, of course, associated with the transport means, being the truck um, in this case. So as you, as you see here in, the, in terms of data model, the main uh, objects that are impacted are transport means and transport segments, as they represent basically the movements of the shipment um, between the warehouse. Um, and the ULD and piece uh, objects are also uh, important here, um, as they are the, basically they represent the shipment. Um, the fourth step after that, so the truck has departed from the carrier domain uh, and is moving to the forwarder hub. Um, so basically this movement is, uh, is recorded through a transport segment and transport means. 
uh, with also arrival and departure events that are added to, this, uh, to these elements. Um, at this stage, if the forwarder wants to need to break down the ULD, um, of course the, the ULD and PCS objects are updated because you, I would say, virtually remove the link between the pieces and the UID that are within in it. Um, and the next step is, uh, of course, the, the loading of the pieces uh, into usually a truck uh, for a delivery to a consignee. Uh, so as well, this is captured via the transport segments and transport means and different events uh, to capture the departure and arrival. Then we arrive at the last step, um, which is the the end of the of the process as we've seen. Um, on this stage, the consent segment and events. So the transfer segment that has been defined before, uh, being the movement, the, the movement from the um, the for water hub to the consignee uh, premises um, as an arrival event uh, on the stage when the truck arrives on the uh, on the premises. Um, and as well, when the, the pieces are actually delivered to the consignee or the customer, uh, we have an event uh, on the pieces, um, which is the delivery. So uh, as, you, as you can see here, uh, in this kind of process, um, most of the, I would say, the messaging word that is today uh, is transcribed. Um, is transcribed in the uh, in the in the data model, um, and it usually goes through uh, what we call events. Um, and most of the the milestones that are defined today in the MOP uh, are easily, uh, I would say, easily derived into uh, into events at the uh, at this level. So I've tried to be uh, to be as exhaustive as possible. Um, in the format we have here, um, one of the I would say the, the question that we we have at, the, at this stage, uh, take um, I would say taking into account the, the presentation that we did, and expecting that you have understood what we the, what messages we want to to to, to put here um, is basically after you've seen if you're not already a pilot, are you willing to test the one record standard in a pilot project? So as you may imagine, we expect to have no no enter because it, um, we we are really um, actually the the last of the webinar episodes that we have will be um, focused on the on the, the pilots. So more information will be provided on how they work, uh, what they are, and how you can uh, you can like apply to them. Um, but it's really important for us to, to know at, at this stage, before we enter into the, um, I would say the whole technical aspect um, of one record, based on the vision and the data model, um, what are the, the expectations from the, from, from the industry, from you guys, uh, and if you are willing to, to, to actually engage uh, into working on a, with one record standard. But at this point, the good, uh, the good thing is that we have no, no one that replies no. Uh, two thirds of yeses and one third of yes, but I don't have the budget or the resources for it. And we know, of course, that um, taking into account the, I would say, the, the current situation in the, in our industry, um, the, the engagement into such, such projects um, can be quite difficult. Um, and, if, and I would say not easy to, to prioritize into, uh, into project projections. Um, but this is, this is really important for us also to, to know how we can um, move forward um, with the pilots we have and we, the different pilots that we want to, to, to implement and what is the industry, um, I would say, um, feedback on their capabilities to, to do so. I guess so. I guess that's a good um, 
that's a good point right now. So two thirds of yeses and one third of yes, but uh, budget or resources risk constraints. So thank you for your feedback on the on this. So I will hand over to David for the next part. So now that uh, so we did webinar, what we needed to do is to give you a high level presentation of uh, what we did uh, in terms of the data model. Uh, what are the different components of uh, the standard? And of course, uh, in this, um, is it, during this time, we don't have much time to go into the details of uh, of the model. Uh, however, uh, we published, um, we used some time during the, the COVID crisis to, to write uh, some articles and uh, white papers. And uh, we published um, four articles that we called uh, One Record Insights. Uh, on the data model, on ontologies, uh, and on object triple mapping. Uh, and also, uh, we published uh, lately uh, one um, white paper uh, dedicated on linked data. All these uh, materials, they're uh, available on our website. Uh, so if you look at the one record uh, website on ayada.org, uh, there is a uh, resource a tab uh, where you can find all of these articles and you will find uh, more articles, uh, more technical articles as well on API and security. Um, talking about uh, knowledge and skills, uh, we have, uh, so as you know, this is the second uh, episode of a series of six webinars. Um, later this year in September, we'll organize a virtual hackathon uh, that is uh, sponsored by uh, Riga Software. Um, the registration are already open. Uh, so you can register. Uh, and uh, in uh, September, uh, right after the hackathon, we'll organize uh, uh, the, as every year the Digital Cargo Conference. But this year it's going to be a bit special as uh, it is going to be a virtual session or um, several uh, virtual sessions uh, during the week of the 14th to 18th of September. And this is the great opportunity as ever uh, to share the latest uh, status of uh, what we do in terms of uh, digitalization and what uh, the industry uh, is doing uh, through uh, panel discussions, uh, presentations, and so on. So now uh, we uh, have uh, covered uh, everything that we wanted to share with you today. Uh, it's, uh, the floor is yours, uh, and we are uh, ready to take on your questions. So, so uh, what we're going to do is that uh, Christophe and I will pick uh, one of your questions, uh, and uh, we'll try to answer it. Uh, uh, and uh, while uh, Christophe uh, will uh, answer one question, I will uh, select another one. Uh, so, we have a first question uh, about the way we work, uh, and the question is, for someone not part of the IATA working group, uh, can we still give feedback on the data model via GitHub? Absolutely. Uh, one of the reasons why we decided uh, to give uh, an open access to our standards is to be able to capture, uh, so first is to be able to share uh, the standards uh, to anyone who would be interested. And second uh, is to be able to capture all the feedback coming uh, from anyone. Um, and uh, if there is, uh, if you want to raise any questions or any comments of uh, any component of the standard, not only the data model, by the way, but also uh, on the API or the security, uh, feel free to use the, the, the GitHub uh, to raise uh, any uh, comments. Christophe, you have and the next one. Big question. I'll take the next one. This is an easy one, not an easy one. Um, so the question is, how are we planning to capture the piece level data entry across the supply chain? Um, meaning that not sure if all stakeholders are willing to scan, to scan all pieces uh, at any time. Uh, this is a really, I would say, tough question um, because from the data model point of view, it's, uh, I would say, we allow for any flexibility in that uh, and we allow for any, anyone, uh, any stakeholder to, to really um, 
update and, uh, and make this, uh, this piece of tracking. Um, the thing is, um, the one record vision is really to, to embrace the, the piece level management and to help the industry move forward. But you, you, you will remain the, the actors in this, uh, in this industry. So I would say it's really up to, to the stakeholders to decide if they really want to do it or not. Um, we on the, on the data model side uh, allow for, for it. Um, but um, I don't know, at least myself uh, specifically, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if we have any, any way to enforce um, this piece of tracking if, the, if stakeholders are not willing to, to play the game, I would say. I don't know if, they, if David, you want to, to add something more to this, uh, to this part? No, that's it. Uh, I think that was uh, uh, pretty well answered. Uh, I have another one, which is um, about the scope of the data model. Um, regarding the one report data model ambition slide, on which topic are you currently working on and which will be the next ones to integrate? What are the priorities? Uh, actually, and this is also linked uh, with the question that we have uh, with regards to uh, quote, uh, request uh, and offer. So basically, um, we are working on um, most of the add-ons that we showed on the slide. So we have a dedicated uh, working group uh, that is looking at uh, the ULD tracking. Um, we have uh, a dedicated task force uh, that will look at uh, IoT uh, data elements. Uh, we have set up a working group that is dedicated uh, to uh, cargo distributions. And uh, one of the outcome of this uh, group is the business requirement required uh, to offer distribution of cargo products uh, from airlines to the forwarder. And uh, in that sense, we identified all the data elements that is required, and we have integrated it in the first uh, release of the data model that you can, you can see today on the GitHub. And basically, it covers uh, the quote um, request, uh, the offer, and the booking. So in terms of that element, everything has been identified and integrated. Now we are going through a second iteration where the idea is to simplify uh, the integration of uh, cargo distributions into the one core data model. But basically, uh, all the elements are already there and are ready uh, for the, the first uh, pilot uh, project. Um, the next uh, topic uh, that we will uh, work on is uh, integration of um, additional uh, cargo products, uh, such as uh, pharmaceutical products. And uh, on, on that uh, point, uh, we are currently uh, running a pilot project uh, for a pharmaceutical shipment and to make sure that um, every requirement uh, when it comes to um, pharma product uh, and every piece of information that would be required can be captured and shared uh, with the one record data model. And the second, um, I would say, uh, product that we are looking at uh, is um, dangerous goods. Uh, we, we initiated the EDGD uh, product uh, a couple of years ago uh, with uh, Lufthansa, Air France, and uh, Swiss. And we want to capitalize on the, the review that we did on the cargo XML message to be able to identify uh, all the different data elements uh, that we need to integrate into the one record data model uh, to um, uh, to make uh, possible uh, the generation of uh, dangerous good declarations with one record. Uh, the last topic that uh, we would like to uh, work on, uh, and uh, this is a topic uh, which is uh, essential uh, for us because uh, it's about uh, the shippers' letters of instructions. As we know that uh, most of the data that we capture are coming from the shipper. Uh, this is a critical um, element. But for that, uh, we need to engage uh, with a more cheaper uh, to be able to capture all these requirements. So I hope that uh, these answer the question. Okay, so I will take the next one, um, which is an interesting one. Uh, how often are you planning to update the data model and when could you say that we have a stable version? Um, so, 
Actually, the data model uh, in itself is a, um, is a continuous improvement uh, project. So with the task force that we have, uh, we are basically working on it almost every day, if I could say like that. Um, so as David said, we have many, uh, many other um, um, add-ons that we are working on, as well as the refinement of the uh, data model as, as it is today, especially the quote and book process. Um, so this is something that we are working on. Um, we plan today to have at least, I would I say, a really, uh, in, say, uh, like uh, at least one uh, update per year. Um, why, why per year? Because it's um, there is kind of a lot of um, work to be done uh, on the data model and the I would say the approval process that we have uh, first among the task force. Um, it's not as simple as that because many people have different minds and the idea is really to find the, the consensus and the best options uh, for the data model. And as of today, the, the COTB is the, um, let's say, the, the governance that, um, that endorses the um, data model. So we have uh, one, um, one version that was endorsed, uh, that has been, has been endorsed uh, during June, uh, which is the current stable version. Um, and you are right to, to put stable between quotes um, because um, the other aspect of the data model is that it, it is intended to be, to be tested uh, while it is being developed. Uh, and this is basically why we have the pilots uh, today because pilots uh, are testing the data model or testing the, the, t the technical specifications and they provide um, important and interesting feedbacks on how it should evolve and does it work. Um, so uh, basically, the, we uh, think that the, the current version is kind of stable, but uh, there might be some major improvements in the, in the next month. And uh, today we, we plan to, to have, a, a, I would say, a next stable version by the end of the year. Um, so we'll see how, how that turns out. Uh, of course, the, the whole crisis that um, that, um, that has struck uh, everyone uh, has um, also slowed down our, our progress, um, but we will try to, to have uh, something by the end of the year. So I hope, um, I hope my, my, my answer is uh, interesting enough for you. David, do you okay. want to take another one question? Uh, I have another one, uh, which is, uh, what is the proposed means to capture the data movement of single piece level tracking as shown in the process? are sure. So the loading of truck and arrival, uh, loading in the truck or arrival at the Grand Honey Agent Warehouse or throughout the supply chain beside the key MOP. Uh, so basically the model uh, is based, uh, is, uh, has been designed uh, around the piece and uh, the piece, uh, so the piece first has uh, a unique identifier uh, but also the piece is linked uh, to a, an event object and the piece also is linked uh, to either directly to a transport uh, segment uh, or uh, through a ULD. So basically every movement of the piece can be tracked uh, at piece level uh, and all the different milestones uh, that the piece would have uh, reached uh, can be uh, captured in the event. So the event object uh, is uh, designed to be generic enough to capture all kind of milestones. Uh, also, you can specify uh, where uh, this event uh, took place and who performed this event. When it comes to the transportation, the actual transportation of the piece, as the piece is um, captured uh, is linked to the transport segment uh, and the transport segment uh, assigned to a transport means. Uh, we can capture the fact that, um, for instance, the piece has been assigned to a leg uh, from uh, Paris to Frankfurt uh, and uh, that um, transport means allocated to the transport segment is a truck. Uh, so by, do, by working uh, in a combination between the event and the transport segment, uh, you can have uh, you can fully document that uh, you have unloaded um, the piece into the truck and that truck departed uh, Paris and on its way uh, to Frankfurt. 
And uh, same at, uh, at arrival, uh, you can document through the event that the, the, the piece uh, has been uh, offloaded from the truck uh, in uh, Frankfurt. Stuff. I okay. think talking about multimodal, yep. uh, there is a question. For you. I will take the next one. So the question is, can you say something about the multimodal semantic modeling group of the EU federated project? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, first of all, what is the federated project? It is an EU funded project. Um, and we are one of the, the participants, uh, the contributors in this, uh, in this project um, that is working on uh, federated network of platforms um, for the, the transportation of goods. Uh, it is focused on Europe, um, but uh, we'll be open to, to, to anyone after that. Um, the idea of this EU federated project is to work on the, on the multimodal approach uh, within Europe. And in, in this part, we, we have taken the lead on the, um, on the working group, which is called the, uh, the semantic modeling group. Um, what we are working on uh, with this group is basically trying to, 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 say to, to transcribe any, any mode of transport uh, into a unified semantic model. Um, so there is the air transport, the maritime, the roads and everything. And the idea is basically to, to, to see what are the existing standards, what are the existing data models uh, that are in place today in each of these modes and we are trying to map uh, all of this together uh, in one unified semantic model uh, that will apply for the federated project. Um, and this is a work in progress that we are starting, uh, I think it's uh, early June or end of May, so it's very, it's very new. Uh, and we have made uh, already some great progress with, um, with the contributors that we have. Uh, and the idea is to have kind of a first version by the end of the, the summer. Um, to have an overview, an eye level uh, semantic model that should cover all modes of transport. So I hope that answered your, your question about the uh, semantic modeling group. Over to you, David. Uh, I have two quick questions. So the first one is uh, the model is based on the MOP, so the industry MOP. Uh, when was the last update? So the last, uh, the last version that is uh, online currently uh, has been published uh, in February 2019, and uh, it is accessible through the Cargo IQ website. Uh, then the second question is about the pilot project. Uh, can companies that are not part of IALA uh, can participate in pilot project? And if yes, how can we apply? So absolutely, uh, and uh, it is encouraged. Uh, the pilot project is not only for uh, companies that are part of IALA, but as we want to um, reach out to uh, the end-to-end -end supply chain uh, from the shipper to the company, any parties who would like to be uh, involved uh, in pilot projects can uh, definitely contact us. And there we have a generic mailbox that you can write to, uh, which is uh, one record at ayata.org. Stuff. Do you want to pick another one? Um, yeah, let me have a look at the questions. Um, um, well, we have an easy one. How can someone join the task force? Um, so there is not, I would say there is no official process for that. Um, but uh, we are open to any, any active contributors in the task force uh, in, the, in the industry. So basically, feel, feel free to contact us. Uh, any, any of the, the one recon members that you may know are uh, us, as you see today. Um, and um, and we'll, uh, we, we can discuss easily uh, after that. So um, there's no restriction today, and we are open to any, any active contributors in the task force. Uh, we have another one, uh, which is about the data flow. Uh, from when do you start to collect the data from booking or as soon as customer has sold goods, including export customs declaration information, or in order to speed the custom import data process? Uh, so basically, the, um, uh, again, the vision that we have is to, have to cover the end-to-end -end supply chain. 
And uh, also one of the um, golden rule of uh, one record that the data uh, should be uh, first um, made available by the data owner. Uh, then the data should stay at the source and uh, whoever uh, who need to have access to this data uh, should be uh, able to have access to this. And when we say that, it means that, as we know, most of the data that we uh, use today, uh, whether it's uh, on transportation contract or on certificates um, or uh, different uh, uh, commercial documents, most of these data elements are coming from the shipper. <clears throat> and that's why the role of the shipper is critical and that's why it's uh, super important to have them on board. Uh, it means that once the shipper knows about the shipment, knows about the items, knows about the pieces uh, that uh, he intend, intend to ship, um, he should be able to make available his data. And then the different parties downline the stream should be uh, able to have access to this data to use these data elements for uh, other parts of the process. So to come back to your question, it means that as soon as you have uh, data available regarding the shipment, that should be made available up front so that all the stakeholders after that can have access and have, uh, can use it for the booking, for operations, uh, for customs uh, declarations, uh, for uh, transport planning and so on. Do you have one? I'll take the next one. Um, this is a very interesting one. Have you planned any synergies with Cargo IQ? Uh, reference to the even concept you just described. Will Cargo IQ be integrated in one record? So this is really an interesting question. And first of all, we have um, in the in one record um, in all the one record task forces. We also have, um, I would say, contributed that are Cargo IQ members and Cargo IQ contributors. So that means that both of the um, both of the projects, I would say, uh, can all work together uh, in, uh, implicitly. But of course, regarding the the events uh, that we that we addressed before, um, we are uh, actually discussing um, with Cargo IQ using the, doc the Cargo IQ documentation and such. Um, and th th we, we are working also on, a, on an alignment um, between, that, between Cargo IQ and what we are doing here um, to make sure that any, any milestones uh, can be captured uh, in the data model through specific events. So um, uh, the integration in itself uh, is done by us communicating, uh, I would say, uh, directly uh, with Cargo IQ members and by having Cargo IQ members uh, within the task forces, um, so this should be uh, taken into account, uh, maybe not exhaustively um, because there are lots that are being produced on Cargo Active side and on our side, but uh, for example in, in IATA's office we are just five meters away, so the communication between us is very easy and uh, we always communicate uh, regarding to what is going on on uh, each other side. I uh, have questions uh, that is related to the way the working groups are structured. So we have a dedicated uh, group of experts for the data model. Uh, we have a dedicated uh, group of experts uh, for the API and security. Uh, we have a dedicated group of people uh, looking at uh, the pilot project um, and making sure that uh, we can capture and share the lessons learned from this pilot project. And then when it comes to uh, the change management and the implementation. So for the change management, uh, at the, for the time being, I think that it's mostly about uh, communications and education towards uh, the industry. And that's one of the reasons why uh, this year we focus on communications and uh, we decided to publish uh, all these uh, one record insights, uh, all these uh, white papers, uh, that's because we believe that uh, this is something that uh, is valued by the industry and that can help an industry to better understand uh, the, the project, the concept, uh, the challenges uh, that we want to tackle and the benefits from the industry. Uh, 
and also uh, through this uh, type of online event, uh, so the webinars and uh, the hackathon uh, and later uh, the digital cargo conference, uh, we believe uh, that this is, uh, these are opportunities uh, to uh, convey uh, change management uh, message to the industry uh, and to um, support uh, this transformation journey uh, from the different uh, stakeholders. Uh, of course, when uh, the time will come uh, and when we'll have uh, more uh, implementation uh, within the industry, um, we will uh, we will need to look at how to best uh, support the implementations, uh, and uh, this is when we will need to look at uh, dedicated task force to look at uh, implementation topics, um, lessons learned, and so on. I'll take the next question. Um, so the question is, does one record design support add-on of data elements to the logical data model entities and one record ontology? Example given, there is a specific data element for booking for the specific airline or for wider business, which is not part of the data model. So as David explained earlier, so we have the core uh, ontology, uh, the, I would say the core of the, um, of the data model, and different add-ons that, um, that all worked on. Um, the idea of the data model is, of course, to be able to add any specific attributes, any specific elements, any new objects easily to the, um, to the, um, to the data model today. And as basically we are the one uh, working on that, uh, the integration of a specific add-on um, is really thought through um, by making sure that uh, at first all the business requirements for the specific add-ons are covered uh, in the definition of different elements and that the integration also uh, goes well, uh, meaning that uh, the integration should be optimized, um, making sure that any existing object, any existing elements um, are easily uh, accessible for the, the specific um, for the specific add-on, and this should be covered. Um, basically, the the integration of an add-on takes a little bit of time because we first have to get all the business requirements, make sure that we understand and that that everyone understands and aligns on them, and then think about the data elements. And there is the whole integration process of uh, after that of these different data elements in the data model uh, as it exists. And there can be also it, uh, iterations on that because the, the vision that we, when I say we, I, I talk about the data model task force have on the integration of, um, of a specific add-on can be different from the, the vision that the, I would say the um, dedicated focus group can have. So there are also some alignments on that and this is exactly what, uh, what happened uh, when we talk about the, the cargo distribution integration, uh, there were some different iterations in that, uh, and we are trying to we are beginning to reach a, a consensus and a, something that uh, that, sh that should work uh, in the in the real world. So I hope I hope that answers the, the question here. Then I have another question on uh, carbon uh, footprint and CO2 emissions. Um, so today, uh, the one for data model uh, includes uh, the possibility to um, express or publish uh, the CO2 emissions of the of the transportation chain. Uh, one of the objective of the of one record is to provide uh, more visibility and transparency to all the different uh, parties and uh, if uh, you look at the logical uh, data model uh, in the transport segment um, object we have the possibility to uh, provide uh, co2 emissions uh, for the transport segment and that would be linked uh, to uh, the actual uh, co2 emissions of the transport means that has been allocated to that uh, to the transport segment, and then uh, as we have this information of uh, CO2 emissions, uh, it's up to the different stakeholders uh, to organize or to publish uh, their information about CO2 emissions, and it's up to the different stakeholders to build on that data model 
to offer value-added services based on the information that is available. So basically, the idea here is to be able to capture that information, and with that information, with that information uh, it gives opportunities to the different stakeholders to build uh, value-added services based on that. Okay, let me look at the questions. Uh, I think I will be the crazy here and take two different questions. Uh, sorry, David, about that. Uh, the first one, what are the tools that are you using for modeling the logical data model? So it's a really simple one. Uh, we have first the old-fashioned Excel way, um, which is basically, uh, as David um, presented uh, before, uh, we have basically an Excel uh, table with all the different objects, all the different attributes, the definitions, the cardinality, the um, I would say all the constraints also that we have on data. Uh, if we have some regulations and stuff, also things like that. And this is transcribed in a, a more visual um, more visual way. Uh, the tool we are using is a free open source tool which is called draw.io. Um, everything can be can be found on the on the GitHub space that we have for one record. Um, we could we could share with you the um, uh, the link, the, the, the tool is draw.io, it's really it's what we have found the, the simplest uh, to use. It's an open source, so anyone can, uh, can have, an, act, can have a, an account and uh, contribute to that. So it's a, it's a really simple one. Uh, but after that, we, um, the, the data model is transcribed to an ontology. Uh, this is a topic that will be addressed uh, in the next webinar. Uh, and there are also uh, very uh, interesting tools to work with the ontology because the ontology is basically the transcription uh, of the logical data, data model into a more technical machine readable um, format and it encapsulates all the information that are uh, in the data model and um, we'll see in the next uh, next webinar that we have uh, interesting tools we have protege that david talked about that we have also some uh, other interesting tools that allow to to have a great visualization um, of the data model from from the ontology point of view. Um, okay, so the, the next question I wanted to talk about, there was one question about the ground handling agents. Uh, let me find it back. Just a second to, to find it here. So what will be the base requirement for a GHA to participate in a pilot? Um, so it's, it's funny because we have actually uh, begun to think about that because on the data model side, we, we don't have any GHA that is participating. So we have, um, we have reached to our uh, IAT colleagues that interact with, uh, with GHA um, and we are thinking of a way to, to have more contribution and more interactions with uh, GHAs in the, in the future. Um, so, in terms of pilot, I think in the um, in the, the dedicated webinar we will go into um, more details into uh, what is what could be the requirement. But uh, as of today, as we said, we are uh, open for any 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 applicants uh, in the different task forces as well as in the pilots. Um, so this is something that can be uh, that can be easily discussed. We have no, I would say, we don't have um, proper requirements to who can uh, apply and what is required. Um, but this is something that uh, we can really discuss on and um, it's true that we have, uh, we have had a lack of uh, GHA participants uh, in the last month and uh, this is really something that we are trying to, to work on today. Okay, so I have a question about uh, the governance. So what is the governance behind the data model and how do you decide what version of the model is valid and can be used by the parties implementing one record? So you need to know that uh, whatever we do uh, about one record, uh, whether it's on the data model side or APIs and security side, uh, falls under the uh, CSC, the Cargo Service Conferences who uh, ultimately decide uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the standards. So the first uh, set of uh, standards for running record has been submitted to the uh, CSC in March 2019, uh, and they endorsed it. And, laid, and after following this uh, endorsement, 
they uh, gave uh, authority uh, to the COTB, which is the Kago and uh, so Kago Operations and Technology Board, uh, which is a board advising the CC on all these uh, kind of topics. And the COTB has authority uh, to uh, maintain uh, the standard. So the standard is uh, composed of a roadmap practice uh, with uh, appendix and uh, the data model, the API specifications, uh, the security specifications are part of this appendix. Um, we try to have a yearly iteration uh, where we uh, submit uh, all the revision of the standards to the COTB for their endorsement. Uh, for this year, it has been done uh, a bit earlier. Uh, this year, uh, COTB endorsed uh, the 2020 uh, revision um, in, uh, that is currently published on the GitHub, and this is the way uh, we proceed. So every year uh, we want to have a COTB endorsement uh, that uh, will be based uh, as baseline uh, for pilot uh, implementations. Time will tell if uh, a yearly uh, revision is enough or if the pace uh, is uh, speeding up and if we, ha we need to have uh, more iteration for the year. But for the time being, uh, we aim to have a yearly revision. Next, we have um, two different questions that are um, kind of linked um, about CIMP and CXML communications. The first one is, do the two parties need to be, on one rec to be one record compatible to exchange data, or can a CCS be used to translate into traditional CIMP or CXML communication? Um, so here, the idea behind one record as a whole um, is to, I would say, not to move away from the uh, traditional messaging model, but one vision does not intend to, to be a messaging, uh, messaging model. It's all about uh, exchanging data in real time and everything. Um, so the messaging world um, is not really, uh, I would say, the focus of, of one record, but we have designed, uh, the way we design the data model um, is to be able to capture all the information that goes through these different messages. So do the two parties need to be on one record, one record compatible to exchange data? I would say yes in the ideal world because we intend to, I would say, to, to really implement one record uh, wherever it's possible. Uh, but can a CCS be used to translate? I would say yes, and it's, a, it's mostly an implementation matter um, based on the usage uh, that you may have. If one party wants to remain to, uh, to keep using traditional messaging communications, um, we cannot prevent that. Uh, but we are really encouraging to, to go through a, through a one-way court um, world. And the next question that, that is really linked to that see, is, are you working on the mapping from CIMP and CXML to the one-way court data model? Um, yes, uh, it's really not an easy task. Um, the, the first, uh, I would say the first thing that we are doing basically is that any, any attribute, any field, any concept that is defined uh, today uh, in CMP and CXML is reused uh, or will be reused in the data model because the idea is not to reinvent, reinvent uh, concepts and, uh, and definitions. Um, will the mapping be very exhaustive? Uh, hopefully yes, um, but uh, as you can imagine if, you, uh, if you're really familiar with, um, with the messaging world, it's really dense, I would say. So there is a, um, a lot of, uh, of work uh, that is required to be able to, I would say, to, to map uh, these two words. But yes, we are working on that. Okay, thank you, Christophe. It's uh, 12.27. Uh, we have lots of questions uh, remaining in the pipe, uh, but we are running out of time. So I suggest that I take uh, the last one. Uh, and uh, we'll close the session here. Uh, so the question that I have is about uh, how about uh, GS1 uh, implementation during search data models? And my answer will not only uh, for GS1, but uh, for all the different uh, uh, other data models out there. Uh, 
uh, with uh, the concept of um, ontology and linked data, uh, what we wanted to achieve is to be able to uh, have all these uh, data models uh, that are compatible with uh, with them. So the use of ontology and the use of context uh, will enable uh, the fact uh, that uh, you don't need to necessarily have uh, the same data model because we know that uh, uh, particularly when we talk about a multimodal uh, and when we talk about uh, shippers and so on, uh, we may have uh, stakeholders that are coming with uh, other data models. Uh, but the point is that uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to, um, to establish and build uh, ontology is to be able to uh, communicate uh, with uh, the different uh, and be compatible with the different data models. Uh, if you want to have um, more information on that, I can only uh, encourage you uh, to look, uh, to go on our website and to read our uh, white papers on ontology. And with that, uh, I think we come to the end of the session. Uh, thank you very much for all the people who attended uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, Please stay tuned uh, for the next episode uh, next week, uh, same day, same time. Uh, it's going to be dedicated on uh, ontology. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of the day. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone.